So read, have you ever read the Lord's answer to Job? So he expected the answer no, or was getting the answer no. Why don't you go and just before bedtime tonight, you read the Lord's answer to Job. You know the one. Um, let's read it in the NIV. Uh, Job, the book of Job the Sufferer, you know the story, um, uh, theatrical, theatrical story, um, uh, a little ep- prologue between God and the Satan. Um, consider myself Job. And, and all sorts of uh, uh, sufferings are unleashed upon Job and his family um, in order to prove uh, the, his, um, his uh, uh, faith and obedience to God is not just due to his uh, prosperity. Um, it all vanishes. He's um, surrounded by, these, by Job's friends, which of course no friends at all, um, for 37 torrid chapters um, uh, Job rails against them and against injustice and in chapter 38 um, God finally finally speaks Um, and the extraordinary thing about those chapters that have become known as the Lord's answer is is that really they're very poetic, it's a giant poem um, each stanza of which is in the form of a question the Lord just poses nature questions to Job over and over again. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea? Where is the abode of light? From whose womb comes the ice? Do you know the laws of the heavens? And can you apply them to the earth? All sorts of questions. Um, Begin to this beautiful thing. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? On who, who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. And these questions continue through realms of uh, creation. Um, the, uh, the light dawn, the early morning dawn. Um, the figuring of the geological landscape uh, of the earth itself. Um, the earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. Um, the, the, the meteorological phenomena of ice, wind and snow, the lightning, um, the stars, the path of Pleiades, Orion, the bear, three constellations are mentioned in this extraordinary, um, intriguing question about laws of heaven and the earth. The clouds, the water, um, and then the, the, uh, uh, the zoological sphere. Um, the ostrich, the onaga, um, and then famously, uh, at the it, towards the end of the discourse, these uh, myth or mythological beasts are they? The leviathan and the behemoth um, that uh, uh, God describes as the pinnacle of of uh, creation. From the questions in the Lord's answer to Job to the current astronomy, biology, zoology, it's all meteor, whatever, it's all, it's, it's, all, it's all there as well as the stunning beauty. So what, what, is, what is going on here? Um, David Kleins, who was here I think last time or the first workshop? Not before. Not before, first workshop. Um, writes, it was such a privilege to have David and to talk with him um, because he has uh, spent his life with this book. Um, the third of three doorstop volumes um, has just been published on the last few chapters. I think he must have been at this about 30 years and they're glorious commentaries. Anything you could possibly want to know about Job is here. But, but um, uh, David calls it the most intense book theologically, intellectually of the Old Testament and who am I um, to disagree. But he also speaks um, of that moment I just read, the moment where the Lord, God, where God, where Yahweh finally uh, s- uh, speaks um, and says that uh, at that moment, any reader and any reading of, in any reading of the book um, cannot help but feel this frisson of excitement um, and wonder up their backbone. He says, even, uh, he says um, even those of us who have grown old with the book of Job, um, and, uh, and I think uh, he probably is talking himself there, but I love the idea of David reading this Every, this moment every morning and, 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 and still receiving the same frisson as, as uh, um, 
Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without understanding? Gird up your loins and so forth. Um, now, of course, but, but of course, that's 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 the thirty-eighth chapter, um, and it, it's it, it's 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 just wrong to jump over all the rest. And the rest turns out to be an extraordinary treasure for a theological investigation and foundation for what our relationship with the material world might might be. Um, so here he goes. You know, it's, it, it's a very structured book. It's got uh, it's got a number of cycles that the the um, that the uh, the friends Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar uh, engage in rhetorical um, uh, conversations with Job. Each speaks, Job replies, each speaks, Job replies. Um, this happens in three cycles. Round about chapters 27, 28, the text gets a bit fragmented and there's, uh, there's issues about ordering, but, um, but something very interesting is, 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 happening, is happening there because it's almost as if the book falls apart under its own tension. The, um, uh, the level of, accus of accusation of Job's friends are, um, increases palpably with each cycle. You'll recall that, the, um, that Job's primary complaint, Interestingly, it's not it's not about his pain. He is it's it's people sometimes say this book is about the problem of pain or the problem of suffering. I don't think that's that's really correct. Um, and nor does nor does nor does nor does Dave not his primary. It's primary. It's primarily around uh, issues of control and justice. It it takes place in a in a initially a theatrical setting, but moves very rapidly to a court of law, and Job is there calling. God uh, as an accused to come to bear witness to being out of control of nature and just as he's out of control of justice. The three friends have a, um, a very simplistic theology. Um, their view is that nature embodies retributive justice um, and the righteous are blessed by the material world and the unrighteous are cursed. So of course they're presented with their suffering friend um, and their own conclusions therefore are, are, rather, are rather obvious. They start by being a very oblique to hinting that there might be something in Job's past or maybe his children sinned or well we've all sinned says Zophar but um, uh, and, and, but, and, and the current punishment isn't probably as bad as it should have been. So God's merciful after all. Um, of course, these weak uh, and, and, and crystalline or fragile narratives bounce off this, this, this suffering joke. Um, but they be, as the cycles go forward, they, they increase in their explicit content until in the third cycle um, they become direct accusations that Job, Job must have, must have, have sinned. Um, the other thing that happens in Job is that the nature imagery, which is often thought to have been, to, to appear for the first time in Lord's, the Lord's answer, and the history of criticism of the book, um, contains a um, Perhaps a superficial story that the Lord's art, one of the reasons that Lord's art is inadequate is that you know, it's this giant nature poem. It's saying, Who are you to ask questions of me? Here are a load more difficult questions that you're never going to understand, so why don't you just shut up and let me be God? I'm you know, paraphrasing, but that's one take on, on the book. And secondly, that they fail to engage with Job's complaints because Job's complaints are of a legalistic and moral and ethical nature and what, that ha what has that to do with wind, fire, star, ice, storm, earthquake, beast? In fact, a close reading of the speech cycles will show you that every, almost without fail, every item of the natural world employed by Shaddai in the Lord's answer 
has already uh, been picked up in the so-called legal ethical speeches. Furthermore, the uh, realms of the natural world parallel in, as it were, crescendo the increasing legal tension um, of the dispute. So the speech cycle one orbits around earth, winds, stones, the sea, the inanimate. Speech cycle two moves more, its centre of gravity more onto the animate, the plant world, the animal world, vines. It draws on the milk and honey um, as being actually given or not given. And it's only in speech cycle three when, if you like, the trombone section comes in and we have the full brass of the legal argument and the whole, whole sinuous tune. I, I, I sometimes I hear, if you know Ravel's Bolero, I can't, I've, I've started hearing Ravel's Bolero when I read, read Joe Walkway through. Um, because it's, there's this like this sinuous little argument that grows and grows and grows, and that little ostinato of 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 the of the just of the injustice and justice going on all the time. And it's at this speech cycle three that the that that do you know the you know the tune that it gets twisted out of all proportion. The trombones come in and start blaring, blaring it out. It, 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 it there's the modulation up another another semitone, and it becomes frightening and menacing. That's when the friends become frightening and menacing, and that's where the cosmos, the, with the nature poetry, opens up into the heavens, the moon, and the and, and, the, and the stars. Um, and of course, um, if you're a composer, as much as if you're a writer of a, a piece of wisdom poetry, you have a problem at this point, because when you've got your whole orchestra blaring out with as much menace and triple fortissimo as you can. What do you do now? What do you do now? Um, uh, you probably know what Ravel does. He, he just stops. <laughs> Starkly just stops. And I've always wanted to. I, I wish Valera had a part two. I have no idea what it does. But of course, not everyone does that. Mazorsky does something different um, in Night on the Bear Mountain. Something that sounds a bit like this. In Night on the Bear Mountain, is shrieking, they're wailing the, 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 the ghosts and the, and the spirits. And then, and then, uh, um, then the sun rises, um, as it were. Um, and it doesn't stop, um, but you have uh, you have a complete change of light and shade, um, uh, to, uh, uh, shade into, in, into into light. Um, nor perhaps another thing, perhaps Beethoven's pastel of the, 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 the thunderstorm. He doesn't stop either. Um, but as the rain drops from the from from the leaves again, you can you can hear a pastel theme come come through again. So uh, we'll see what happens with Job. Because something very interesting happens to Job. Job doesn't stop at, at, at this point. Um, so just for a little while, um, let me take you on. I mean, do buy the book next next year. It's got uh, it'll come out. It's got it's got a long chapter, a big thing on Job, um, which I've actually partnered with something we'll do this afternoon, um, which is a chapter on exploring chaos and emergence and uncontrol. Because in many ways, um, as uh, uh, as I'll point out, this is a book around the theology of, of chaos and, and lack of control. Um, but just give you a little taster of where the nature trail goes through Job. It starts right at the beginning, of course. It's nature, via nature, that, uh, that God um, un unleashes or allows to be unleashed on Job through wilderness and, 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 and wind, the suffering in the, in the first place. And at the very beginning, the connection of the material world out there and the material that makes me is it becomes an integral part of the narrative. It is no coincidence that as well as the storm and earthquake destroying Job's outward chattels, um, his bo own body is invaded as, as well, sores, afflicted by nature without and within. And his response is a creation narrative. He sort of re-echoes or anti-echoes Genesis chapter 1 by talking about the first day of creation, but you realize he's really talking about the first day of his life. Um, and and he, ple he, 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 he pleads that, that the sun had not dawned on his, his first day. Interestingly, would that the curses of days had laid a spell on it, those skilled at rousing Leviathan, we have in the very first chapter of Job, uh, the seeded reference that will emerge right at the end of the book in the Lord's answer in the arousal of Leviathan from, from the sea. That's an example of what I, what I 
I talked about before, that, that almost every image or picture in the Lord's answer is, is somewhere in, in the nature discourses of the, the legal dispute beforehand. So, um, uh, Job's accusations, are his tor that his tormentors act like chaotic, chaotic nature. Um, he, my brothers have been as treacherous as the wadis. These are the, these are the, uh, uh, the dry, uh, the dry river beds that swell and grow um, with, the, uh, uh, with, with, with the sudden floods. Um, one moment it, there's a drought, um, the next moment there's too much water, um, and the seeds are uh, uh, driven away uh, by, 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 by spate. Um, so be, we begin to see this parallel accusation by Job that, that God is in no more control of chaotic nature than he is of, of, of Job's, own, uh, Job's own prosperity and, and health. Um, uh, similarly, his accusation of decay and disease and chaos in the external world is paralleled by the same accusation in the internal material world of his own frame, this extraordinary image of his own flesh curdling like, um, uh, like cheese. I guess that's what a soft matter, slimy physicist ought to be interested in, but it um, doesn't smell very nice, does it? Um, and uh, uh, Job explicitly points out the, the lack of, of law embedded in nature. Um, and then, or oh, enter William Blake, who of course illustrated this wonderful book. You might see a little bit of, bit of him from time to time. Um, this extraordinary clash of where hope lies uh, in all this. And this is Eliphaz in chapter 5. Um, the writer of Job, occasionally, um, it's, a, it's a clever book and you can be caught out. Um, most of what the comforters say um, is trite, superficial, fragile, um, what Rowan Williams called um, a faithless kind of faith. You know, the Old Testament version of a frat. But just occasionally, uh, the writer of the Pile of Gold puts little, little flashes of depth beneath the surface of what they say. This is one in Eliphaz. Um, At ruin and blight you will mock. You will have no fear of the wild beast when he's repented, this is, okay? Uh, for you will be in covenant with the stones of the field, and the wild animals will be at peace with you. Um, this is the same Hebrew covenant as is used in Genesis and Exodus. This is a real covenant. Um, and translators have wriggled around this, of translating all sorts of ways, but that's what it's saying. Um, and uh, so th there's one other place in the Old Testament, which is in Hosea, chapter 6, where this, this idea of a covenant existing between um, humankind and the material world is, is uh, hinted at. Nice idea. Um, and yet, uh, and, uh, but, but the same breath, Job says, no, there's no hope for this. Um, and gives us a rather geological time scale. I thought Simon Paul Morris might like might like this one. It's it's, it's, um, it, it's a, a, a a little insight into what some people in the Hebrew world of the first millennium the sort of geological depths of time um, they might have been um, um, aware of. There's an argument in Lucretius, I think, that uh, um, that uh, that actually is an argument against the infinite um, length of of the world that says, look, you know, occasionally bits of mountain fall off into the sea. Um, and that's not compatible with, their, with the world having been around forever. Um, here too we've got a, but, but here's Job's taking that, look, look at the world is slowly in decay. If the physical world's in decay, there's no hope for me either. Um, the, uh, I mentioned that the third cycle with the brass section um, blazons out into cosmology for the first time. Here's Aliphaz. Uh, talking about the canopy of heaven, the topmost stars, highest they are. Um, and uh, rather extraordinarily, um, talking about a, a rather blinded God, an unsighted God by the, uh, by, 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 by the vault of, 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 of heaven. Um, and Bildad's uh, uh, extraordinary vision that has often been actually taken out of, out of context um, uh, Perhaps out of its Hebrew cosmology, but this is. But it's very easy to read to read this. Um, 
and 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 think of the Earth hanging suspended in in uh, in space, wrapped up by the clouds. Um, beautiful stuff. What happens when Ravel cuts Bolero short, uh, and the anger has nowhere to go? Is in Job. The writer to Job brings in this extraordinary hymn to wisdom. Um, and that begins with what for me is um, one of the most sort of precious metaphors for what science does, what this ancient reconciliatory explore, exploration of nature uh, does. It's, it, at, at first reading, it, it looks extraordinary, but it takes us down a mine. Um, Surely there's a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined, iron is taken from the soil, rock that will be poured out as, as copper. And there, underneath it, this foreign race, because most miners in these dangerous jobs were, came from, uh, were, were, were travelers from other, other countries, um, dangling and swaying on ropes. But look what it says. The earth from which food comes forth is underneath changed as if by fire. Its rocks are the source of flecks of gold. Um, only the eyes of human beings. No other animal, not the eagle, not the lion, can see what they can see. They can see how the earth is made from beneath. They get to see not the superficial phenomena of the world, but the structure of the rocks underneath. Now, um, it's a beautiful uh, chapter, this, and it's disingenuous because it doesn't tell you for a long time where it's going. You read this for the first time, you think, why am I being introduced to... to um, to gold mines and to miners and ropes and lamps on hats and why am I finding myself whistling hey ho hey ho it's off to work we go um, but ah, halfway through it introduces what this chapter is about it's the, it's the search for wisdom where can wisdom be found and the reason that the poem takes us to under the ground and it takes us to the bottom of the sea and then it takes us to the marketplace is because it's looking for wisdom in the natural world and you'll Let's recall the sea says it's not in my. I don't know where wisdom is. I've heard it might be at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the mountains, but the roots of the mountains say no, no. We haven't we haven't seen wisdom either. Um, and then, right at the end of that of that chapter, we find that God does embody wisdom. God knows where wisdom is, and He understands the way to it because He looked to the ends of the earth and beheld everything under the heavens, so as to assign a weight to the wind and determine the waters by measure. So wisdom is found in the person of God because God is the one who looks through nature as if the natural world is somehow semi-transparent into its furthest corners, its great its depths and its extreme heights, and measures it and weighs it and comprehends it. So when we then, after some speeches by a new character called Elihu that I do not have time to talk about now, but it's well worth meeting Elihu, he's slightly different and has some interesting things to say. When the Lord finally answers, we now begin to see the ties. And straightway, if we keep that last vision or embodiment of wisdom from the hymn to wisdom in our minds, we see that what God is doing is taking Job by the hand, a um, little, little bit like the snowman, takes the little boy by the hand and whisks him off all around the world, and takes Job on a tour of all these places that God has seen and perceived and weighed and measured. It's, so it's, it's, it's much more than just to hear a load of things that you can't understand, Job. Some of the questions are easy to read in a trivial way, but need a little bit of diving into. So when he asks who cuts a channel for the torrent of the rain, thinking a path for the thunderbolt, thinking about the wadis and the lightning we've had all before, it's an interesting question because the answer is, well, no one cuts a channel. But actually, what you do, what you need to do with a chaotic, aleatory phenomenon like uh, like a, a, a torrent, like a flood, um, is channel it. You can't stop it. You can't dam it. But when nature works well, nature works with its chaotic forces, not against, not against them. 
Um, and of course, the answer encodes um, a challenge to the simplistic cosmology of the friends that just encodes morality in, in nature. Can you lift your voice to the clouds and make floods of water answer you? Can you send lightning bolts on their way and have them report ready? Well, no. Nature is given her own freedom, um, her own action, her own activity. Otherwise, um, uh, she would be devoid of, of, of life. Well, um, so no more to go into the... Uh, that's a little bit of close reading to give you... A, because without that, you wouldn't believe anything that I, that I would say. Let's just draw back on on a, um, what I think are the dis different perspectives on nature that Job, con Job, uh, the book of Job contains. I think there are, uh, there, are, there are six. We've met one several times. So the first take on nature is that of Job's friends, that it just simply enshrines a retributive mod moral law. Um, uh, the second is that, um, uh, um, and this is in, uh, clear in some of the things that uh, Eliphaz, uh, Elihu says, um, uh, that, that it's really an eternal mystery uh, that we can't really know. It, there is depth there, but it's not. It's not. It's not for us to know. Um, there is undoubtedly in 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 some of the friend's speeches, but below the surface, and in things Job says, a book of nature to be read. Um, that God, that that God's faithfulness, purpose is built into nature, but not in the simplistic, moralistic way of the, of the friends. Of course, the fourth view is that no, nobody's in control. Um, God is in control. And, and nature is as capricious and, 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 and harmful as uh, it seems to be. There's a fifth view, which is very unusual to us. It's very unfamiliar to us, though I suspect that some of us here who come from a different, a non-European uh, southern context might be more familiar with this uh, than those of us from a northern and western context, that nature is, of course, an object of worship. Um, and there's a wonderful little hint. Uh, it's a beautiful um, and uh, very empathetic uh, admission of Job, of his temptation to worship nature in his final speech, just before Lord's, the, it, to, which is an answer to Elihu, uh, he's much more reflective. The anger seems to be taken out of him. Um, and he's, he's beginning to look back as, uh, uh, on his own behavior. And he says, look, I would have, I really don't think I've ever, ever blown a kiss to the moon. He says it much more beautifully than that. Um, and of course, you know, in, in a, in a western sodium glared lit city you know with the moon vaguely glimpsed between smoggy mists there's one thing but of course in a middle eastern desert in the velvety night when the stars are uh, twinkling you know, the, the 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 and every community around you is worshiping the created rather than the, the creator it's a very tempting tempting thing um, of course the last the last story is actually this is nature is a way to wisdom it was the way to wisdom for god himself and it's a way to wisdom for us um, now i don't know if you spotted the mapping i don't think this is forced but there are old narratives here or old embodiments of the narratives that we met before um, rich, rich, the, you know, uh, nature harming us, exploitation, the eternal mystery of things we never, we can never understand is alienation. The nature, the sacred nature we must never touch. The uncontrolled chaos, the Pandora's box, the object of worship, the be careful what you wish for, the desire. Yeah. And the fact that Job embodies and discusses all of those and rejects them and provides us with another narrative to meet them begins to look a little bit more practical and contemporary than a pure exegesis of an Old Testament text. So um, five um, aspects that then you know, that might actually take us from Job towards um, what I might call a theology of science. A Judeo-Christian enshrining of a purpose not just for our modern science, but our modern science sitting at the end of this long engagement. Um, so, one thing is, it tackles this ac accusation of out of control. It subverts this whole control narrative. 
Um, and because, it's, it, because of the questioning that it takes uh, to, towards na nature, gets us thinking more deeply um, about just what sort of controlled, neat, well-behaved nature we might be asking for. Um, the surface of the moon is a very controlled, well-behaved place most of the time, but it's rather arid. Um, what very few commentators have noticed, by the way, particularly those that rail against the inappropriateness of the Lord's answer to Job, is that it does actually achieve its purpose. I mean, it, at the level of the text, he is reconciled, he does repent, he is blessed, he is even vindicated. God declares Job to be right before his friends. It's quite extraordinary. And one of the ways it does this is by both what I call central and decentralizing. So a, a, a common element of a quite correct um, element of com commentary on the text is that the Lord's answer is a great material decentralizer of, 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 of humankind by looking at Behemoth and Leviathan, by declaring these as the greatest of all my works. Um, implicitly subverts the wrong interpretation of the Genesis narrative, like that humankind is the greatest of all God's works. Nonetheless, um, it also centralizes Job as a sort of representative human, um, as engaging with this perceptive wisdom of God in, in relating to nature. So it's participative and invitational. You can't read all these questions without hearing, without seeing the beckoning finger. Without, without seeing a come with me on my journey through all of the depths and heights and lengths and breadths of, of creation and see and understand and participate with it. Um, and it's deeply affirmational of physical nature, particularly in the context of the whole story. You can't be a kind of body-spirit genius after you've read this book. You simply can't. Um, and finally, now this is... Uh, this is a bit personal, but I'm convinced of this, and you can nail me to the wall at question time. I think it's eschatological. Um, it point well, it has to be, you see, because I, it, if it's not, if it's not, um, well, saying, hey, these are some hard questions, you don't know them, so uh, I'm b bigger and better than you, then it's got to be eschatological because because you can't answer these questions now, but one day you might. And the reason I think that there's this eschatological voice in, 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 in Job that points towards a reconciliation with material world, what takes us to where George Steiner wants us to go um, and become reconciled with the inhuman otherness of matter, is that it's in this context of linear history, um, it's right in the middle of a Hebrew, not just a Christian vi uh, vision, an Old Testament vision for a healed world that's in Isaiah, it's in Hosea, there's a um, of course, there's a place we're going to where our ostensible and painful divorce with nature is, is going to be healed and reconciled. Um, it's, it's an answer to the nature poem you read in chapter 28. It affirms that the underlying grasp of nature is important, but we don't have it yet, so we need to work towards it. Um, and its explicit openness in structure and content opens us to a future of perception and learning of, of wisdom that isn't our present yet.